right? And it, it really comes down to, you know, little or no uh, manual server management. I mean, there's always going to be some level of management when we deploy applications, right? Um, you know, automatic elastic scale, um, built-in resilience, because if it's a serverless thing, it should just be there. And if I have to actually engage with the, with the thing to make sure that it's actually fault tolerant, that's an issue, right? Uh, it has to be always available and has to be instant. And I think this, this last bullet is probably the one that I think is changing uh, the minds of a lot of people around serverless and really coming down to changing the way that we, that we, that we use and, and buy software as, as developers and, and the way we actually you know, run these things. I, I, I love the, concept, the concepts of consumption-based uh, you know, billing. You know, what is my monthly bill? I don't want to deal with you know, buying a license for something for a year. I only use it for like two months out of that year. It's wasted compute especially in the day and age of us having, you know, these large bills to the large, you know, cloud providers. How do we actually minimize and, and become very efficient with our compute and, and only have like kind of consumption-based, you know, rating and billing for around these things. And I think if I think about those four kind of core principles of serverless, that's pretty cool. And I think we've come a long way with serverless. Serverless, you know, we have these like these, these compute platforms, you know, Fargate, Azure services. I, I really love Google Cloud Run. I think it's pretty cool. You can you know, take any containerized app and just throw it at Google Cloud Run and it'll scale that thing up and down. It, it's pretty slick, y'all. I'd go check it out. Um, but it's kind of just managing the infrastructure underneath. And then there's this, this emerging group of, of companies that are doing, you know, serverless functions. Again, you know, the big three all offer that. But then, you know, I think about, you know, Cloudflare Workers and Netlify and these sort of things. I'd love Netlify. I think Netlify is super cool. Where it's more event-driven. Uh, you know, it's a function that a developer can call and it just basically spins up, spins down, is used as, as needed. It's just a function that basically, as you code, just sits in a directory. Um, and I think these serverless functions are pretty, pretty cool. And I loved it, the concept of serverless functions and the concept of lots of things that we do. Um, and then there's these kind of these larger serverless app development kind of platforms that are that are starting to emerge where I think they're putting it all together. They're getting compute, the functions, the whole thing. And I think, you know, we start, start thinking of like the modern IDE and what is that going to look like? You know, do we get to the point where, you know, we're kind of doing some of these things? I, I do believe that that this this kind of next generation of app development is happening. And, and, and it's really because I think some of the things that we've seen over the past two years of, of building serverless and, 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 and using this and, and the value it can provide to, to, to people who use these things. Now, when you start to deal with data, um, things get a little bit more complex when you, well, <laughs> within a serverless environment or without, right? Like when you start to deal with, that, with data, you, you have to start thinking about, you know, great, I'm, I'm, I'm resilient and I'm fault tolerant, but to what level, what's my failure domain? Is my failure domain a region? Is it, is it just an AZ? Is it a, is an entire Kubernetes cluster? Um, how do I survive the failure? Because these things do go down, right? Um, how do we scale these things so that they can actually, you know, if it's serverless, well, I don't want to be serverless within a single region. I mean, you know, how do I expand beyond regions, you know? And, and for databases, you know, the transactional guarantees get really, really tricky here because if I have, you know, a person in New York writing a record and somebody in Sydney writing the record at the same time, who wins? How do you how do you deal with these kind of conflicts? And so there's things you have to do in the software to actually mitigate these sort of things. Um, but if you take this and you take those serverless principles and now let's apply it to you know the database. And then that's what we're going to use as our example here. Well, in a database in the old world, you know, we sharded database, you know, we had, you know, two instances of a database, you know, multiple shards. So we got scale. We we're doing the synchronization between two sites. Maybe there's a primary and a secondary one in one region, another in secondary region, or maybe I need coverage in Europe. So I have, you know, uh, this sharded full database thing going on in US West. And then I got something over in Europe and I'm doing synchronization and I, it, it gets really complex. In, in this modern world, this, this becomes more of a, a distributed platform, right? And we start to apply these principles to this distributed mindset so that you know, each entity is kind of part of the bigger whole. And that's how you get serverless because scaling big, massive pieces up and down, down to zero, it, it's near impossible to, to do that. It takes, you know, 10 people or even two people to do that. that that's too much. Serverless is about automation. It, it really is. And it, it's how do you automate these things? And so when we think about the, the concepts or the, 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 the core primitives of our, of our application, how do we break them down so that we can scale them separately? Uh, and that's really the trick behind serverless. Now, in a serverless database, again, the data creates big challenges. How do we auto scale? 
um, putting data close to users so they have low latency access to that and thinking about these transactional latencies, right? Ultimately, I feel like serverless and the term should be infrastructureless because these are the things get 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 really complicated. Um, you know, scaling across regions, these sort of things are, are are really tricky. I think ultimately the the end game of serverless is about. I think I you know it's the value to the user, whoever is using these sort of things. And for developers, I think it's about starting instantly. It's about eliminating the need to manage, upgrade, operate, no operations, right? I don't want to deal with scale and I want to completely eliminate downtime. I don't think there's a developer in the world who wants to even think about any of those things on the top of this, of this, of this slide. I think what we want to do is just build. Um, you know, I think we want, we want transactionals, we want data to be guaranteed consistent. We want it in real time. Um, and I think ultimately the, the end game of this, at least for us at, at Cockroach Labs, when we think about a serverless database, you know, if we really think about that. And, and, and you just have an API against that database with endpoints around the planet, could the database be something simple as a SQL API in the cloud? I don't even have to think about any of these things. And if we remove the stuff across the top of the slide and we start to just build and, and code against the database just as an API, things get really interesting. And I think that's the, like, to me, that's the ultimate vision of kind of what, what serverless can do for the database. And so, you know, think about that. What, what could that mean for you and your application where you're just some, blank blank API in the cloud, right? And and that's you know for us it's a SQL API in the cloud. Now let me actually I'm gonna actually give a little quick demo here. Be you know, why not? I mean, you know, I'll I'll go out on a limb here. So I'm gonna go to cockroachlabs.com and you could spin up a cluster using our serverless instance right now. I just need to log in. I just hit the sign. Oh I'm already signed in. And so it's really as simple as create a cluster. We have serverless or dedicated. Dedicated is a you know full instances where we have SREs managing it. It's private. Our serverless instance is multi-tenant. You choose a cloud provider, choose a region. Right now we're AWS and, and Google Cloud, um, and and you set a spend limit. Now this comes back to the consumption-based billing, um, and and as consumption-based billing becomes kind of more more important understanding consumer behavior around it is actually pretty important. We've gone a long way to think through this. And, and for us, it was like, well, let's just put limits in place so that, you know, you're never going to spend more than $10 a month if I put $10 in my spend limit or zero. It could be completely free forever. And for us, that means, well, I have to throttle usage of the database over time. What does that mean for your application? Because I don't think anybody really likes to get a bill at the end of the month where some service just ran wildly for, you know, 20 days and I get charged, you know, thousands of dollars, right? And so... I think as we build these things, we as developers need to be uh, cognizant and, and aware of, of what people really want. And for us, you know, having spend limits was, was a big deal. Um, and then we just named the cluster. So I could just create a cluster. Um, it's going to be ready in a couple seconds here. And what's happened in the background, and I'm going to show you exactly what's happened. Um, so I'm going to create a user, generate and save password. Yep, great. And I'm going to hit next. I have a cluster up and running. And I have, um, you know, I have a complete set of connection strings. Uh, I can use a general connection string parameters. I can use the cockroach DB client, um, all these things. Basically what I have is I now, I have a Postgres cluster. I have a Postgres instance, basically. It's a cockroach DB serverless instance. We're wire compatible with Postgres. So any of those kind of Postgres tools you would use or drivers, uh, they should just be able to connect to this. And so you're just gonna use the, the connection string or parameters. I use parameters when I'm using a bunch of different tools or just use a cockroach DB client. And now you have a complete uh, a relational database um, that is resilient. It's gonna do auto scale. And I'm gonna show you what it does underneath the cover. So quick demo basically is it's pretty easy to get basically a cockroach DB cluster up and running. Um, there's lots of more information on our website about what cockroach DB does, how it's different than other things. But ultimately I think in the simplest form, it's kind of like Postgres, but automate all the scale eliminate the concept of, of, of downtime, uh, online schema changes, upgrades, all that. Uh, it's, it's, that that's really kind of the, the big stuff of what it does. So, so that's the quick little demo. Uh, I encourage you all to go out and check out a cluster. So it's, it's uh, pretty easy to get going. So, okay, so let's talk about architecture. Let's drive into kind of how we did what we did. And this is really the topic of this. So a database is really comprised of three layers. There's a language, there is a SQL execution layer and there's storage. Every database really is kind of developed and, and thought of in this way. 
And really, ultimately, any one of our applications can be thought about like this, right? Like there's an API with my application. Okay, sir, is it a UI? Is it just some basic, you know, REST API? I don't know. Like that's the language. Like that's how you communicate. It does things and it stores data to disk. Literally, a database is just like every other application. They're a little bit more complex. Uh, <laughs> they're not easy to build. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but they're all kind of like this. Now, in distributed systems, you know, I think there's databases on the right-hand side you know, we have a distributed database, you have to start thinking a little bit differently because, okay, so the language is still the language, storage is still storage, but actually in storage, am I storing data across multiple different places? Because remember, this is a distributed system. This is no longer a monolith. This isn't like one server. We're using many, 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 right? And so we have distributed storage. We have to think about how we get data to that. That's replication and distribution. Distributed execution becomes very important, right? I can have a single instance of Postgres on distributed storage, well, I still have a single instance. All my rights have to go through there. I haven't solved the scale problem, right? So how do you distribute that for both reads and writes? Well, in our database, or how do you distribute your execution for, I don't know, whatever you're doing in your application and starting to think about these concepts is actually pretty important. I think the shift towards distributed systems is where these things are happening. So the divide of, of where you cut your code apart to actually make something serverless is really between execution and storage. Because if we think about serverless and what we're doing at the storage layer, things need to persist. They cannot be ephemeral. Like they, they need some sort of a, a consistent existence, right? And you need to make sure that those things are up and running at all times, right? Whereas at the execution layer, I don't, I'm not relying on something that needs to be, you know, like it, it, it's in that, in that item, right? I'm just, I, for us, we're just executing a query. We're gonna use storage, right? And so taking away and, and understanding what's ephemeral versus what needs persistence, that's the, that's the divide in your application. So look through your code and figure out what, what is those lines. Do you need to re-architect things? How is this gonna work? For us, we had to kind of re-architect and tease these things apart. Luckily enough, it was pretty modular in our code. So we're, it's fairly straightforward to do that, but that's the trick to really thinking through things that are serverless. I've talked to you know lots of people building serverless applications. This is the same pattern emerging across the board. And I think it's kind of one of these things It's fairly simple once you see it. Ephemeral versus persistence, scale ephemeral, scale persistence in a different way. Uh, and I think that's the trick, right? So let's get into the storage layer. In the storage layer of what we're doing, it's a little bit different than some other databases, right? Like in, in Cockroach, and I, I kind of have to go through kind of how Cockroach works, but hopefully this is valuable to you as well from an architecture point of view, just so what we had to do. Ultimately in Cockroach, everything, all the data is stored in a KV. In, in, it uses KV underneath. Now we translate KV to relational, so it's it's SQL. Um, but ultimately, and you don't need to know what's going on in this, this logical key space, but every table is basically this huge monolithic logical key space. It's all ordered, right? And KV allows us to do some really interesting things. And this it's it's all ordered is is the key thing. This this lexicographically by key is the is the trick here. And so what we do is we take all the tables and we convert them to KV. The K being a table name and index, the key, and then a column name. And then the value is the value for that particular column. So let's just show how that works. Here's a quick table. It's the dogs table. I have an ID, I have name, and I have weight. And I have a bunch of entries. Now, this just looks like this is just a table. This is simple DDL, same thing in Cockroach, relational. If you're familiar with SQL, you get this. And this is what my data looks like. I could select all from dogs. I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna get back. Underneath the covers, what we do is we actually, when we actually store the data at disk, <clears throat> we're gonna take and we're gonna translate each row into these KV pairs. So, okay, here's the, the table name is dog. My primary key is 34 for that, the, the ID, right? And then for the name um, column, I'm gonna have Carl. Okay, for the weight column, I'm gonna have 10.1. And I just go down the line. And so we're translating records into KV. Now, if you look at the ordering of this, right? Dog 34, name, weight. Dog 78, name, weight. Dog 94. So what we're ordering them. So this basically all gets encoded. It doesn't look like this dog slash 34 last name. We're actually encoding these things so that we can actually get really, really you know, efficient sorts. So underneath the covers. And we know exactly where to insert things into this ordered lexicographic pair. Now that's pretty cool. It's what allows us to actually actually understand, you know, where tables are when we start to actually um, move them around. Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. <clears> throat> Excuse me, everybody. Sorry about that. So 
what did we do to make this serverless? Well, if we're going to use shared storage underneath, what if everybody had a dog table? I wouldn't know which dog table belonged to which person. So what we did is we just basically added a tenant ID to the key. And so now this is Andy K's dog table. So uh, what was my cluster? I forget it was like, I don't know, uh, sparkly kitten or something. I forget what I, we come up with these funny names, but like that would be, you know, it belonged to that particular tenant. And so what we do is we're just appending that to the front of that. And so now in this huge lexicographically ordered KV set, all of the records for that particular tenant are together. And then inside there, you know, the tables are all kind of sorted and then the keys and all the stuff, right? So basically what we're doing is we have, um, you know, we have a complete understanding across everything and we're using one big shared storage layer, but the tenant key is what's allowing us to understand which parts of this data belong to who, okay? Um, let's see here. Uh, there was a question that came through. What is the most appropriate naming convention to label nodes on a Kubernetes cluster? For instance, controller and responder. Well, gosh, I don't know, Emra. I'm not. Uh, I, that is an interesting question. I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Sorry about that. I wish I did. I don't. I don't. Like y'all, I live in this architecture, the application layer. I don't get too deep into like the the. I understand how Kubernetes works, but managing it is is complex. And kudos to all you who do that. Um, but maybe somebody else knows. Sorry, Amar. Um, all right, so that's great. We just talked about the storage layer. We had to actually think about what we were doing from a storage layer. We then had to think about, okay, distributed execution. We're already doing that, but how do we tie that to, to a particular tenant? How do I make sure that, you know, Jim's execution is just mine, right? And this sort of stuff, right? So. Again, let's go back to what we're doing in, in Cockroach and with this big, huge key space. And we added, um, you know, we added this whole, like the, 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 the tenant to each of the keys and this sort of thing. Um, and then basically what we're doing is we take this big, huge KV range, right? And we, and we or this big, huge KV sort, and we cut it down into these ranges, which is basically these 512 megabit ranges. And, and, and the thing of this is like the way that we shard a table. We're just taking these ranges and they're small enough so that we can move them around really quickly and and we can and we can write them to different physical nodes or different nodes that are running in pods in a kubernetes cluster right and basically that's how we kind of distribute the data um and that's a kind of a key concept in in in, in cockroach now if you're going to do this we actually have an index so we can have to find these ranges you know so the first range lives on these servers and whatnot and so we have an index structure that allows us to locate these things. It's very much like a, a B tree, uh, if you're familiar with what that is. Um, if you want to check out how we do this, our, our code is completely open. You can go check out our Git repo and, and actually check this out. Underneath the covers, though, we're using something called Raft. I hope people, I hope many people on this are familiar with Raft. If you're not, um, Raft is a is a really interesting concept as a as a developer and anybody who's kind of thinking microservices and distributed systems, if you're on this webinar thinking Kubernetes, um, definitely kind of check out Raft and see how it, how it applies to what you're doing. But Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm. Now there's another one called Paxos. Some people use that as well. And what it does is it's it's distributed system and it's gaining consensus. It really allows us to get atomic reads, uh, atomic rights and consistent reads in what we're doing. Now, what is Raft? Raft is basically, it's an algorithm that manages um, replicas of, of whatever it is you want to actually manage uh, and, and write, say, to disk. In our case, the reason I had this little like blue thing, well, this is that, you know, this is that range that I had before. This is the second range. So we basically break up our ranges and then manage them using Raft. Now we create replicas of these. So we have three copies here. Within Raft, you want three or five or seven or nine, 11, you know, the odd numbers because you want quorum. So when I write to a Raft group, I want two of three of these to commit. I want two of threes to say, we're good. And then say, everything's good because a third will come along or three of five, right? So it gets, a, it's a quorum based transaction, right? So we get this quorum and actually make all these things work. Also in, in, in Raft, there is a, there's this concept of a leader. It's a special replica and there's two followers. All the rights, all the commands kind of go to through the Raft leader to the followers. And it basically manages to make sure everything's good so that you only have to ask one raft later. It's like, great, is this good? Yes, it's good. And I can acknowledge back to the application, whatever it's doing. It's going to have this kind of authoritative, up-to-date answer for what's going on within, within that raft group, right? Um, this also allows us to get atomic replication. So we're going to make sure that this is going to happen. Like the, the whole transaction is going to happen or not. It's going to coordinate with other raft groups because I'm doing, you know, I'm doing transactions across, you know, 
maybe hundreds of ranges because maybe I'm inserting 10 records or I'm doing a select across different things and doing joins. Like we can do this kind of cross shard transactions as well. And that raft leader is going to manage that. It's going to help with consistency and make sure that, you know, the, the, the atomicity in ACID actually uh, gets committed. Okay. So if you want to learn more about distributed consensus, you want to learn more about raft, um, there is this really wonderful website. I, you know, I haven't been there in a while. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's still going on. Uh, somebody probably would have told me, but the secret lives of data.com, uh, I'd go check that out. It's, it, they give a great kind of visual representation for, for how Raft works, much better than I could ever do. So. Um, so we use Raft then to actually distribute data, right? So each Raft group, right? There's three of the copies. It's the same data, it's that range. We're gonna distribute them across three different nodes in a system in CockroachDB, right? And so that's what we're doing. We take the first range, we write it. We take the second range, we write it. We take the third range. What this allows for is kind of scale. I can you know, I can scale, I can add more nodes so I get more capacity. Um, all of these nodes could service reads and writes. I'm highly resilient. If I lose a node, I still have two of three of the copies left, right? And so that's kind of the, the special nature of what we're doing. And that's kind of, that's helping us at the storage layer. Okay, great. So. How do I kind of pull all this together and, and, and now make this serverless? And this is the trick of how you use Kubernetes to actually do all this, okay? Um, but one second, before I get this, there was a question. Debanju writes, is it possible to allocate a network volume as persistent storage to these nodes? Cluster on-prem, OpenShift cluster, and network volume EBS, S3, or EFS? Um, yes, you're going to have persistent storage, and you're going to use basically in Kubernetes, if I presume this is a question, you're going to use the storage class and you'll just make a PV claim um, from inside that pod. And then you'll use stateful sets within the context of the, the storage nodes, like the, where you need to persist. You use stateful sets to actually maintain that persistent connection between that pod and whichever volume um, you have actually, uh, uh, you, you have actually uh, connected to. Uh, and then so each of the storage, like here within this context of this, this is us deploying a, a, a database. This could be any application um, on, on a Kubernetes cluster. What you're seeing in the bottom, those that, that color is this, this is just a pod. And this blue box is, is the is the is is the application itself. They're all communicating to each other. And so if I wanted storage, I'm just gonna take a I'm gonna use storage class PV claim. I'm gonna use you know stateful sets to actually attach that to each one of these pods so that I could actually uh, persist that demand you. So it's a great question. Took me a while to figure out the storage class when I got first introduced to, to Kubernetes, how this works. So, so for us, you know, this is one single logical database across multiple different pods. Uh, every one of these things can, can take uh, reads and writes. This is just SQL. Uh, you can do cross shard queries. You can do, we can actually deploy this across multiple regions and multiple Kubernetes clusters. We can have one single logical database, which is pretty cool, right? So you can, like your failure domain can actually go up to to entire Kubernetes cluster. This was a database that was built literally on the same exact principles as, as Kubernetes. This wasn't like take a database and do auto sharding and try to make it work in this context. No, this was basically built with the same kind of principles. And that's why it works really well within this context. And using Kubernetes to actually build this out as, as a serverless cluster is pretty cool. And so what we did is we said, hey, look at, let's look at our, let's look at our stack, our, 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 our layers within our product. And we basically took this kind of the, the, the execution and how to find the data and the, the, the language. And we put that in one version. And then we took the other side and it was the storage of that data and that's separate. And so what we're doing is we're running a completely separate cluster of CockroachDB that's doing storage only. And each of those kind of pods in the bottom they have their own PV claim. They actually understand where that storage is. And I'm just communicating to them. They can, they can service requests for basically getting data. And remember, this data is spread across all my users, across all their tables, is now distributed across, okay, this is just three nodes running in three pods, but this is, it could be hundreds of pods. And the SQL execution layer just works with, this, with the storage layer to basically find that data. So lots of different data and users in the bottom. And then the SQL, the execution at the top. And the SQL execution part is ephemeral. So here's a virtual cluster for a, a particular tenant. We have three execution pods and it's just accessing its data underneath. And I can scale basically the execution now get really, really efficient, right? So, you know, tenant one needs three different execution pods because of their, their bandwidth, right? Uh, tenant two only needs, you know, um, one. Tenant three needs three, right? And it really depends on the, 
on the load uh, that that person has. And that's a key concept in with serverless, right? Scale up, scale down, scale to zero, right? Uh, make it really efficient. So, you know, what do you get charged for? Well, for us, it's how much storage and how much compute you use, right? How many transactions? And that's really allow, we're, we're able to scale these things separately, which is a key kind of concept within serverless as we think through this. So, so how does this look? In Cockroach DB serverless, we have like this storage and replication nodes. Uh, we have more than one in each of AZ, but you know, we're doing a lot of them. We're actually working on making this, you know, across multiple regions. So you'll have this across multiple AZs and then regions as well. As beta right now, it's within a single region. You spin up a, you know, so tenant one is living on, you know, three different availability zones. So if I lose an availability zone, I still have other two other pods to actually go against. Again, it kind of improves that resilient nature. So tenant two comes in as one and then tenant three. And so we're just basically randomly, you know, deploying them across different AZs. Now, if you're going to do this, you need to be able to find what it is, is your compute layer, right? What is, where is this thing? And so, you know, we built a, a, a piece of software, which is basically a proxy, which understands where my tenant is. So if I come and ask any one of these proxies that are, that are in any one of these AZs running, it knows, it has a manifest, basically, it says, hey, tenant one, here's where you can find tenant one's execution layer and route that query or route that request, whatever you're doing in an application to that particular user, right? So we tease out the ephemeral compute from the persistent storage, and then you need to find things and we built a proxy to do that. It really as simple as that to actually build out, you know, a, a, a serverless thing. Now, data also scales, transactionals, a, a transaction scale as well. So volume of data will scale at the, the persistent layer down here in storage or replication. We're just gonna keep adding capacity there, right? But 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 the but the the ephemeral compute that goes up and down based on you know the the traffic right and so we needed to you know accommodate elastic usage deal with spikes and spin things down to zero and this is all done via these kind of ephemeral kind of SQL pods so we built this capability uh, in Autoscaler and Autoscaler basically is looking at you know each particular CPU for these pods and understanding you know what are the usages over the last five minutes we're looking at peak peak CPU usage. And all within the context of a particular tenant, right? And so if a tenant needs capacity, we spin up new capacity. If they are not using it, we spin it down. Um, if it falls to zero, we'll completely remove the tenant from the cluster. Um, and so that we aren't using compute that, that we don't need to pay for. So how does this look for? So here's our diagram from before. You know, we've teased out the two layers. Um, tenant one, my capacity, my steady state capacity is, is average here up on the left, left hand side. It requires three ephemeral pause to deal with that amount of traffic. Um, but at some point I get a spike. I don't know, it's like 5 p.m. and a bunch of people come online and I'm getting a lot of orders come in um, and it's, it's going up. And so what we do is we have these things we, we have in each, each, each cluster in, and there's a cluster in each availability zone. We basically have these unassigned hot pods. They're basically instances of my ephemeral compute later that are just unassigned. So the proxy doesn't even, they just know they're there, but they aren't assigned to a tenant. And so what I do is I basically take one of these hot pods uh, in the proxy and the manifest that it says, hey, assign this to tenant one and start using it. I have just scaled capacity like that. Because these things are already up and running, it's up really fast. I don't have to worry about the time it takes for the pod to start and then start the application, all these things. It's just running and unassigned. And that's what we did. Now, when things return back to steady state, I spin that thing down. And if it goes all the way, right, it's like middle of the night, nobody's asking for any transactions, we scale that all the way down. So the auto scaler is actually doing this in the, back, in the background. But then most importantly, say a query comes in, it wakes up that tenant. And so we're able to spin up a SQL pod very quickly. I, it's under a half a second. And it's for that first query that comes in. I know we're trying to drive that down to like, you know, under 100 milliseconds, under a tenth of a second. And so... You know, right now that's that's kind of you know a, a big focus, right? How do we get these up and running really fast? Another big problem you have to deal with in the serverless world because well, people want these things to actually come up really quick. And so what we're doing is again, we just take this hot pod. We don't have that latency of spinning up the the Kubernetes, you know, the pod instance, and we're assigning that to a particular tenant. The proxy now understands that all the proxies know where to go. So if a query comes in against any one of them, it knows where to go get that 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 tenant, right? And so. So that's that's basically how it works. That's that's what we've done to basically take something what was a distributed system fairly elegant, but then tease out this kind of ephemeral compute side from this persistent storage layer to make our application serverless. Now, 
it was fairly straightforward for us because well we were already a distributed system you know so like kind of applying these principles were a little bit easier but i think if you start from scratch thinking about this like as you build your ne next application how do you kind of tease these two things apart and in, in the architecture of application makes a whole lot of sense because you kind of prepare yourself to apply the serverless principles to whatever it is that you're building and i think that's the that's the trick and for me the the big takeaway Again, you saw me create an instance, you know, y'all please go feel free to go out and build your own uh, cluster. It's pretty, pretty easy to sign up. We're going to give you a free cluster up to five gigabytes of storage a month, 250 million request units, which is pretty ample. A request unit is just basically an abstraction of a query. All queries are not similar, you know, like select star from where and, you know, join blah, blah, blah. That's much more query than select star from customer, right? So that's the way we do that. Uh, and, and, and it's free. Uh, so you can go out and do that right now. Um, request units are interesting. If you, um, if you, if you run out of request units, we don't actually, you don't run down to zero. So you have no capacity. We actually reserve enough capacity so that you have enough for the rest of the month. So we basically kind of throttle it. So like this last scenario is easy. You have 8.64 million request units. If you use everything on your first day, you have that amount for the rest of the month. Right. So it's, it's, it's fairly good um from from that point of view so um so the the amount to choose uh, what's the chargeback model for this cockroach db um the charge model is basically uh, you can add a gigabyte of storage or 250 million request units for additional i think it's a dollar per or for, i forget what it is you have to go to the the website and look at that but um it, it outlines all of that um but but it's free up to up to that certain level so okay so that is all my presentation um, there weren't a whole lot of questions. I hope it was valuable to everybody. Um, I do hope to see people live. Uh, I'm, I'm super excited to go to KubeCon uh, and be live with people uh, in, in a couple of weeks. I'm also really excited to go to Valencia. I, gotta, I, would, not, I would be lying if I didn't say that. Uh, you know, the, the Cockroach Labs team will be there. We'll have lots of engineers who can talk through these things with you. We can talk about our database uh, as much as you want as well. We'll be giving away things, all these things. Um, if you're thinking about going, I really look forward to seeing people again live at, at KubeCon. It's the my favorite two shows of the year are KubeCon Europe and KubeCon North America. So I'm really looking forward to to getting back with everybody. So um, with that, if there's no other questions, I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time today. I hope this was valuable to you. You know, I you know I hope I did a little bit of a balance between us talking about a database, but kind of how we thought about going through this this serverless journey. I really hope it came. I, I really hope that was of value to people. So, um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, that was my other presenter this morning. That's my friend, Rain. Oops, I didn't fix this slide. So um, thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate it. And have a great day. Great. Thank you so much to Jim for his time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>